Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored and I kept hearing over and over, you need to talk to Dan, you need to talk to Dan. And as, as we talk about this, it's Doberman Dan. And is that the Doberman barking? I, you know what? I Can love I the shit? intro. You I, know, I, 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 I have to keep going with it because this is what makes it real. And so today we have Dan Gallup, who is also known as Doberman Dan, as you heard, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. He's been running successful direct response and online businesses since 1995. And I remember watching your videos, Dan, like you know, you've been running businesses since you know before the internet. And so you're going to talk about direct mail and you know the successes with that and how that can be applied today. And he keeps a very low profile and remains behind the scenes except for being featured speaker at several seminars put on by the legendary late copywriter Gary Halbert. Dan, thank you so much for joining me. It is my pleasure, Jeremy. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, apologize for the noise I told you. No, that's, you know, it comes with the territory. You know, we don't do editing, so we just we just go with the flow and go with the conversation takes us. You know, Dan, I usually ask about since it's inspired insider, I ask about the low point and the proud moment. And you talked a lot about low points and. You know, there's one that I was researching that I thought you were going to talk about, but you didn't, which was when you had the emergency surgery. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that like you've been beaten down enough, but <laughs> what happened with that? I'm pretty grateful to be speaking at all. Um, yeah. Anyway, I went to the doc. I, you know, my voice was getting scratchy and I could see something in my throat. Turns out it was a cancerous tumor, <clears throat> uh, thyroid, which, you know, as the nurse said, which was not really reassuring at the time. She's like, well, if you got to have cancer, thyroid's the best one to get. Right. Um, so you know, I guess statistically, thyroid cancer doesn't normally That'd spread, you know. So um, I'm thinking, oh, OK, cool. Well, you know, we'll get that taken out and hopefully be done with this. But um, what the surgeon had found out is the tumor wrapped itself around my vocal nerve, oh my God. the nerve that controls your vocal cords. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's why my voice was scratchy. And when I talked for any length of time, I'd start to lose my voice real fast. So um, they just said, ah, you know, I'm good, but I don't know if I'm that good. So your vocal n nerve may need to come out. Wow. So the, the best case scenario would have been, you know, I'd be left like a Clint Eastwood kind of voice. <laughs> you'd be able to talk, but really not that well. Yeah, you'd be like, you'd have a whisper kind of thing going on, which maybe would scare the people. You know, like, well, let me ask you something. Do you feel lucky, punk? That's pretty good. Um, you know, it's just cool when you're imitating Clint Eastwood. Not so cool when you're trying to, I'd like a sweet tea, please. No worries. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, went into the surgery thinking I'm either going to come out of this not speaking or, you know, maybe I'll be lucky. So I obviously picked the right surgeon. I can't really sing anymore. I've totally lost what range I had. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be still speaking. You know, I got to tell you, I, I don't really view that as a low point. I really don't. Uh, that was also emotionally freeing for me. How uh, so? You know, when you realize that none of us are going to get off this earth alive, <laughs> it makes it easier to enjoy the ride mm -hmm. a lot more. And, you know, not that I was ever, uh, not that it was ever a, an issue of it being, you know, a, 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 a fatal thing or cancer that could spread and turn into a terminal thing. Statistically, thyroid cancer doesn't do that, but cancer automatically has that stigma to it that it's a death sentence. For sure. So, you know, I guess I, you know, started thinking about my mortality and stuff, and all that stuff was outside my control. The, am I going to be able to speak? Or are they going to have to cut my vocal nerve out? Totally outside my control. I was worried, yeah, but, you know, I worked really hard to not let it control me. The only thing I could do, just like when I was homeless, only thing I could do was just focus on what I could control 
and and do that. Yeah. So yeah, you know that was as crazy as it sounds. That was actually good experience. A freeing moment. Yeah. Then I started branching out and doing the same thing in other markets, um, selling info products like that. That was my go-to formula, the test, the lead, small lead gen ad. And then I got online in 1996. Granted, it was pretty uh, wild, wild Rough west from the back edges, then. Yeah. But uh, when Google AdWords became somewhat viable, then I just duplicated that same process with AdWords because it was faster to test sure. online. Yeah. So then you had that. Um, that was a big turning point. What was the next big milestone for you? Uh, a big milestone was preceded by probably the one of my, not one of my, my biggest failure to date, the most humiliating uh, time in my life. And uh, ironically, what followed after that was a f few months later was the biggest success of my life in a, a bodybuilding nutritional supplement business yeah. that I had started. So tell me about the big, if you feel comfortable telling about the big failure and then about the big success. Well, <laughs> you know, if somebody, I think somebody should like maybe study my life and do the exact opposite <laughs> of everything I've done. And that's the way to go. Um, so I had this supplement business that I started in 2004 out of desperation because I lost uh, my income and was broke. And so these pro hormones were hot at the time, these hormone precursors. And I knew they wouldn't last long. I just thought, I'll take advantage of this temporarily. And that worked really well. There was a big demand for those. And sure enough, um, the FDA came in and then regulated all of them. So that like killed my business overnight. Uh, concurrently, at the same time, I was going through marital discord and, uh, and separated from my wife. So I had no income. My business was back to zero and no money, no credit. I was in, <laughs> was in debt. All my credit cards were maxed out. Wow. And no place to live other than like a 10 year old beat up Ford Taurus. So mm -hmm. I actually had to live in that car while I put my life back together. Holy cow. With my 80 pound Doberman, by the way. <laughs> he was living in the car with you? Yeah. Wow. And, uh, this was the end of May. So May, June, July in Florida, in the car, living in the car with no air conditioning. The air conditioner didn't work. <laughs> Just throw that on top of everything else, right? Yeah. Holy so, cow. Uh, Jeez. I guess I do my best work when my back is against the wall. Because, That's um, putting it lightly. Yeah. I developed a, uh, a new supplement product or I asked the lab to develop it, I should say, the lab I've been using. And uh, I would go to the library every day because there was a computer there and free internet right. and basically had to start a whole new business again. Yeah. How do Luckily, you, I have to back up, you know, I have yeah. to ask this because you, you've you know, obviously overcome that, but at the time that seems almost insurmountable. Like how did you motivate yourself like in that situation to actually, you know, most people, I don't know if they would be able to climb so quickly. Oh, I'm going to go library and do this new supplement business. I mean, people are stuck in the mindset and position they're in. It, it did seem insurmountable at the time. It was completely humiliating. Uh, what I really wanted to do is I just wanted to go get some liquor and drink myself unconscious. Uh, but I had this dog with me that I mm. loved, mm. you know, and many days I would go buy his dog food and I wouldn't eat because the choice was, well, do I eat or does the dog eat? And I, I always chose the dog, yeah. although there were a few nights that dog food was looking pretty good. Yeah, I would see. Uh, it. I mean, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so really the dog was a big inspiration like during that time, like taking care of, of the dog. I'm afraid without the dog, I'm afraid I might have made the decision, meh, got a few spare bucks, I'm going to go drink myself silly. Yeah. Uh, because, you know, it's just a way of uh, masking the pain temporarily. But, you know, had to take care of this dog. And 
I had the hope. I didn't have a whole lot of success under my belt, but I had enough success in various ventures that I knew yeah, I can pull out of this. You could do it. Yeah. Yeah. You'd seen it. Okay. So, uh, you know, it was humiliating. There, were, uh, You know, it was the lowest point of my life. I mean, you know, everybody talks about considering suicide. That, that actually seemed like a logical option at the time. Wow. It was it was really dark. Um, but you know what? That it seemed like that dog saved my life on, you know, metaphorically in that instance, actually physically and a couple other instances. But, you know, again, that cr- Donner, my crazy Doberman, you know, having to take care of him, <laughs> I, I guess I can relate to, I don't have children, but I can really relate to how people oh, feel sure. about their children. Yeah. I'm sure it's not the same, but it, you know, maybe. No, I'm similar. sure it feels the same for sure. For pe- Yeah. And plus dogs love you unconditionally. Yeah. <laughs> your, yeah. Your children, oh, which is pretty nice. not so much. <laughs> no, maybe sometimes. Um, so then you pull, you were going to the library and you said, ne- what was next? Went to the library. So I got, uh, got a website up, got copywritten for this product. I'm not going to sleep tonight, Dan, because of this interview, because I'm just going to be <laughs> thinking about this. So, <laughs> uh, so let me see. I, uh, I, I recycle. I mean, I was desperate. I didn't have time to split hairs over this. I had to get something up. So I recycled as much copy as I could from the pro hormone product. Because it worked. Yeah. And then I adapted other parts to this new product, which had, you know, no pro hormone ingredients. It was a creatine monohydrate and some yeah. other stuff. Creatine was hu- is huge. You know, that was huge. Yeah, back then it was still huge. Now it's like commonplace. You can buy it in Walmart. But, you know, back then in that niche, it was, you know, the most popular supplement. So I go to the, that's what I was working on the library, getting the copy written and then getting that website up. Luckily, I still had a little email list from that previous product. Um, So as soon as I got the website up, I threw some traffic at it. And, uh, the lab actually basically gave me net 30 day terms on the product. I begged them to sell me really small quantities, I think like 144 bottles. And they gave me net 30 day terms. If I couldn't sell this stuff, there would be one more debt. You're up in Creek. Yeah. So they, they fronted me that, um, threw some traffic at it, had a very small list, but luckily enough to get some sales, some sales started coming in and, and uh, I still kept living in the car. How do you fulfill it? You just were shipping it yourself? Um, I had a company, a fulfillment company that I had a relationship previously with all those other little ventures. I'm just trying um, to picture you in the car with a dog and then f- like 100 bottles of <laughs> creatine or whatever it is in the yeah. with you. It was luckily I had the lab. I didn't have to do that. Uh, I had the lab ship it to the the fulfillment okay. center and I had had a relationship with them for at least, I guess, nine years prior to that with, uh, with that little, with all the info businesses I'd done. So they took care of that. And then when the money rolled in, I just kept, you know, uh, eating tuna, living out of the car and then rolling that back into more and more ads, which uh, was Google AdWords at the time was what was working was there is just anything that was early on or were there certain things that were working at the time it was you know what a lot a lot of that i think was attributed to timing and luck because adwords was still a new media and i was getting clicks on there ridiculously cheap Mm -hmm. like it was so cheap man maybe cost per acquisition was five dollars at the highest so five bucks or less on a $40 initial sale, you know, so uh, it was just, it, it was the wild, wild west days of Google AdWords and they were letting you throw traffic at anything. Yeah. So then when did you get out of the car? Don't it keep was me actually, in, that, in my seat here. It, it was about a month. I guess it was about a month later. Yeah. Um, I'd saved up enough money. I could rent this little, uh, basically two room apartment. And I was thrilled with that. <laughs> and it had air conditioning. And uh, still just lived real extremely frugally because I knew 
I, I learned this lesson the hard way from several other ranchers. Uh, when you got a winning horse, you got to keep riding yeah. it. So what did you so do? I just kept rolling more and more and more and more money into it. Um, and I mean, I was living in poverty. This, this was a terrible neighborhood. The apartment, I, my office that I'm in now, I think is bigger than that apartment I oh. lived in. And I had no furniture, I had an inflatable mattress and that crappy old Ford Taurus. That was it. And still literally, you know, going every day down the road to the dollar store to buy tuna for my meals. So just kept rolling that money in because no matter how much I put into AdWords, gosh, I miss those days. I mean, I would get it all back multiplied. Wow. So that business grew so fast. Um, it was, it grew so fast. My head was spinning. In fact, I didn't even look up for about four months. I just didn't look up. I just put my head down and thought, I learned this up the hard way before I am riding this horse until it drops dead. Mm -hmm. And when I looked up four four months later, it, the realization finally hit me like, wow, I am living in dirt poor poverty and I make more money in a day than I used to make, you know, several months working for the police department. And, um, it was, a, it was that to me, that was an incredibly rapid turnaround. That was, that's still, uh, one of my favorite success stories, <laughs> not so much for the success. Yeah. That was cool. And seeing Just the contrast. Yeah. The extreme contrasts.